It's 7 p.m. Monday, September 23rd, here in Seoul. Coming up on News Center tonight. South Korean President Moon Jae-in will meet with his U.S. counterpart Donald Trump in New York. Nuclear talks with North Korea and strengthening the ROK-U.S. alliance will be high on the agenda. Hyundai Motor is set to establish a joint venture in the U.S. with a global autonomous driving firm investing some 2.4 trillion won in the new business. The trade war between the U.S. and China takes a toll on merchandise exports around the world. South Korean merchandisers, heavily dependent on China, are among the worst hit. And it's home runs galore for South Koreans in Major League Baseball. LA Dodgers' Ryu Hyun Jin collects his first career homer, while Texas Rangers' Chu Shin Su sets a personal record for the most number of home runs in a season. New Center begins now. to our viewers in Asia and hello to others watching from around the world. Welcome to Adidas News Center. I'm Handan in Seoul. And I'm Noor Adam. Thank you ever so much for joining us this evening. We start with President Moon Jae-in's five-day trip to New York. He has a busy schedule lined up and will be focusing on efforts to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula. He will begin with a summit with his U.S. counterpart Donald Trump, where the ROK-U.S. alliance will also be discussed, followed by a keynote speech to the U.N. General Assembly. Our Blue House correspondent Shin Se-min leading us off in New York. Two moments stand out as the highlights of President Moon Jae-in's marathon five-day trip to New York. First, his one-on-one -on -one with his American counterpart Donald Trump on Monday local time, which will largely focus on North Korea-related matters. Second is his speech to other world leaders at the UN General Assembly on Tuesday. It'll be another occasion for the South Korean leader to show the world what Seoul has been doing to try and denuclearize the peninsula and forge a lasting peace. The spirit of the UN which aims for world peace through multilateral talks is most needed on the Korean Peninsula. The ninth summit between Presidents Moon and Trump will be their first since President Trump came to Seoul in late June. With their meetings scheduled on what appears to be the cusp of North Korea and the U.S. resuming working-level nuclear talks, the issue is likely to be at the heart of their discussions. They both want to ensure the working level talks go smoothly so the process can gather some much needed momentum after months of stagnation. Prior to his arrival in New York, President Moon expressed his determination to do all he can to foster peace and prosperity in the region. Also on the president's agenda, upgrading the already strong bilateral relations between Seoul and Washington. A more touchy subject is negotiating next year's cost-sharing agreement for U.S. troops stationed in South Korea. The trade route between South Korea and Japan could also come up, considering the U.S. government's well-publicized disappointment that Seoul terminated an intel-sharing pact with Japan as part of its response to Tokyo's trade curves. The uptick in tensions has put the U.S. in a tough spot, as South Korea and Japan are key U.S. allies in the region and the linchpins of the ongoing denuclearization efforts. Also on the schedule on his first day in New York, President Moon will have meetings with U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres, as well as his Polish and Danish counterparts on strengthening two-way ties. The president's biggest overseas mission this time is picking up his mediator role in the stalled denuclearization talks between North Korea and the U.S. He sees himself as the best position to solidly lay the foundation for lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula. Shin Se-min, Arirang News, New York. And this just in, Hyundai Motor Group will create a joint U.S. venture with the global automotive technology firm for the development and sales of autonomous vehicle technologies. The group announced today that it'll sign a contract with Aptiv PLC in New York Monday local time. The group's affiliates, Hyundai Motor, Kia Motors and Hyundai Mobis, plan to invest a total of two billion U.S. dollars in the joint venture. The new firm will be headquartered in Boston with technology 
technology centers across the U.S. and Asia, including Korea. The Hyundai Motor Group says its goal is to have a production-ready autonomous driving platform by 2022 for robo-taxi providers, fleet operators, and car manufacturers. South Korea's foreign minister says the U.S. is ready to openly negotiate possible sanctions relief and security guarantees for North Korea in their working level talks. She added that the two sides' top priority is to agree on a roadmap to denuclearization. Our Oh Jung-hee has more on this one. With the president of South Korea and the U.S. set to meet in New York on the sidelines of the U.N. General Assembly, Seoul's top diplomat says the most important agenda is finding ways to resume nuclear talks between Pyongyang and Washington. At a press briefing in New York on Sunday, Foreign Minister Kang Kyung-hwa told reporters that Seoul and Washington are analyzing the North's recent statements to see what the North wants from the U.S. in return for taking denuclearization steps. Pyongyang has hinted that it wants a security guarantee and sanctions relief, both of which Kang says the U.S. is willing to negotiate openly. She added the most important task is to agree on a roadmap on how to achieve denuclearization. The U.S. has recently signaled to North Korea that it's willing to be flexible. President Trump himself brought up the idea of adopting a new method in negotiating with the North, with former National Security Advisor John Bolton, who promoted the Libyan model, now having been removed from his post. Watchers say that the U.S. could be considering snapback measures. That is, once the two sides agree on a comprehensive deal that clearly defines the end state of denuclearization, the U.S. could partially lift sanctions, which could be immediately reimposed if Pyongyang doesn't follow through on its pledges. However, whether the North will be willing to accept the snapback deal is yet to be seen, because the North is leaning more towards a phased agreement instead of a comprehensive deal. North Korea-U.S. nuclear negotiations are expected to resume later this month in Europe or Southeast Asia. The delegations are to be led by U.S. Special Representative for North Korea Stephen Began and North Korea's new nuclear envoy Kim Myung-gil. Oh Jung-hee, Arirang News. Talks between South Korea and the U.S. and defense cost sharing for next year is set to begin from tomorrow and will be held for two days in Seoul. South Korea's foreign ministry says Chang won sam the lead negotiator in the previous talks, will be heading the meeting until his successor is named. It is widely speculated the former deputy chief of the Financial Services Commission, Chong un bo will be next point man. James DeHart from the State Department will be representing Washington. It's reported that Washington asked Seoul to pay more for the annual cost of 50 billion U.S. dollars required to keep American troops on the peninsula. Seoul is currently paying some 860 million U.S. dollars. The two Koreas and the United Nations Command have come together to repair a typhoon-hit building situated in the inter-Korean truce village of Panmunjom, an unprecedented move since the signing of the Korean Armistice Agreement in 1953. That's according to the UN Command on Monday, which added that the three parties have mainly worked on repairing the roof of a conference room building for three days starting September 12th, ruined due to Typhoon Lingling. During the repair work, some North Korean workers are said to have crossed the military demarcation line located inside the Joint Security Area, an incident that had been approved by the UNC in advance. Japan is reportedly considering collecting military intel concerning foreign countries through private satellites to try to make up for the void of information left from Seoul's decision to terminate Chisomia, a military intel sharing pact between South Korea and Japan. Citing multiple government officials, the Yomiuri Shimbun reported Monday, Japan's defense ministry has set aside nearly 932,000 U.S. dollars in related projects for next year. Citing several Anonymous sources, Japan-based Kyoto News Agency reported that the move comes on the heels of Tokyo failing to track North Korea's short-range ballistic missiles more than two times since May. 
The trade war between the U.S. and China seems to be slowing down global trade in merchandise. In South Korea, merchandise exports fell by the second largest amount among the G20 nations in the second quarter. Our Hong Yu has more. South Korea's second quarter exports of merchandise decreased by 8.6 percent on year to 138.5 billion U.S. dollars. The decline was the second biggest among the countries that are part of the G20. The country's exports remained sluggish in the first 20 days of September, having fallen 21.8 percent in the month so far, compared to the same time period last year. If outbound shipments continue to slump the rest of the way, South Korea will post a record 10 straight month of export decline. Experts say this is due to the trade war between the U.S. and China. 70 to 80 percent of South Korea's exports to China are intermediate goods for China's processing plants. For South Korea to export these goods, China has to be actively importing. But the trade dispute between the U.S. and China has impeded these shipments. As a result, South Korea has been hit the hardest. The biggest fall in second quarter merchandise exports was seen in another country highly dependent on China, namely Indonesia, at 9.1 percent. Among the two parties to the trade war, however, merchandise exports fell much less, the U.S. by 3.1 percent and China by 1 percent. The U.S. and China trade on a big scale, but it's much smaller for countries that export mainly to China. So because China takes up such a big percentage of their total export volume, it's a bigger decrease for these countries. Only five countries in the G20 shipped more merchandise in the second quarter, and those were Canada, Turkey, Mexico, Argentina and Australia. Going forward, the WTO's Goods Trade Barometer says global merchandise trade volume will likely remain weak in the third quarter of 2019. The latest reading for September was 98.4, falling just below the baseline of 100. Hong Yu, Arirang News. It looks like the next big thing in the world of smartphones is the foldable phone. The first batch of pre-orders for Samsung's Galaxy Fold sold out on the first day, and uh, Lee Kyung-un tells us why. It took only 15 minutes for the first pre-order of the Galaxy Fold to completely sell out. Thousands of units were immediately bought on Samsung's official website on Wednesday, as well as during the second pre-order on Friday. The situation was no different for local mobile carriers and electronic retail shops. The premium gadget is priced as high as 2,400,000 Korean won or 2,000 U.S. dollars, but that high price tag isn't putting off those looking to be the first to get their hands on the Galaxy Fold. More than 20,000 units have been sold already, and some people are even willing to pay as much as $4,000 to buy the phone off resellers. But it's not just the high demand that is causing the phone to sell out. Industry experts are pointing to undersupply as the main cause while giving varying explanations for the supply shortage. Some claim Samsung is artificially holding back the supply for marketing purposes. The high price and limited stocks make customers who do get their hands on the phone feel special. Others say that with Japan's expert curves on high-tech materials, Samsung could be struggling to secure related components, namely polyamide, as Japan's Sumimoto Chemical has monopolized production of the component. Samsung has previously denied such concerns. There's also technical issues to consider. The Galaxy Fold is the world's first foldable smartphone and already saw its launch delayed due to technical defects in April. As a result, it requires a longer manufacturing process and stricter inspections, especially at such early stage of its release. With no details known about the next pre-order, there is still excitement among those consumers who are eager to be one of the first in the world to own the Galaxy Fold. Lee young -un, Arirang News. Thomas Cook, the world's oldest travel firm, declared bankruptcy on Monday, leaving thousands of tourists around the globe stranded and sparking the largest peacetime repatriation effort in British history. The tour company had enormous debts and said it failed to secure an emergency loan package from its creditors. The UK Civil Aviation Authority said it would launch a repatriation effort with the government to bring back home more than 150,000 British travellers over the next few weeks. 
Another suspected case of African swine fever was reported this morning at a farm in the city of Kimpo, just outside of Seoul. This is in addition to two cases detected last week not far from the capital. The Agriculture Ministry says it's now inspecting the farm. It also says it will ramp up efforts to disinfect these areas after Typhoon Tapper passed through over the weekend, likely washing away disinfectants that had already been applied. The ministry will be working with other state agencies and local farmers and will be using military vehicles to administer the chemicals. African swine fever does not affect humans, but it is fatal to pigs and can be dormant for up to 19 days, so the next three weeks will be crucial to stopping its spread. Meanwhile, pork prices seem to be going back down after a temporary spike that uh, last week because of the initial outbreak of African swine fever. The Agriculture Ministry said as of Friday, pork prices had fallen some 14% from the previous day. A kilogram wholesale was selling for around 5,001 or about 4 US dollars. It had gone up, up to 6,201 when the authorities banned all vehicles from moving in and out of pig farms nationwide. But more pork has since been released, except from the areas directly affected by ASF. Recent data shows that the five-year period from 2014 was the hottest one on record. The finding comes as delegates meet on Monday for a UN climate summit, where UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres is expected to call for further cuts to greenhouse emissions. Isengje reports. Published on the eve of key talks in New York on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly, the World Meteorological Organization has published its latest data on climate change. Shocked by what it contains, weather experts have expressed serious concerns about the latest assessment. According to WMO's data, the five-year period from 2014 to 2019 was not only the warmest on record, but it also led to a significant rise in sea levels. While the average rate of sea level rise was 3.2 millimeters a year from 1993 to 2019, the average from 2014 to 2019 had shot up to 5 millimeters. The 10-year period from 2007 to 2016 saw an average of roughly 4 millimeters a year. The report also indicates global warming affects the world's oceans the most, with more than 90 percent of the excess heat caused by climate change soaked up by the ocean. Analysis showed 2018 had the highest ocean heat content values on record. Experts attributed the changes to carbon dioxide emissions hitting new highs over the same period. Data shows carbon emissions were up 20 percent compared with the previous five years. The release of the data coincides with the special UN summit on climate change, which takes place in New York on Monday local time. A number of political leaders will attend the one-day event, which according to UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, is designed to be about action, not empty pledges. Greta Thunberg and other youth activists who have been marching on the streets of New York will be there to call for action. In addition, about 60 heads of states are also expected to join, with countries expected to announce new plans to slash emissions and set up new multi-nation environmental protection initiatives. Lee seung Arirang News. Meanwhile, a Red Cross report suggests that a lack of action on climate change puts hundreds of millions of people at risk. It could also cost the world tens of billions of dollars. Also Young has the details. Without decisive action to tackle climate change, hundreds of millions of people could face a humanitarian crisis by the year 2050. That's according to a new report released by the International Red Cross ahead of the United Nations Climate Action Summit on Monday. By 2050, 200 million people every year could need international humanitarian aid as a result of a cruel combination of climate-related disaster and the socioeconomic impact of the climate change. This is nearly twice the estimated 180 million people who need help today from the international humanitarian system because of floods, storms, droughts and wildfires. The report says that the cost of doing nothing comes at a price tag of some $20 billion per year by 2030. However, if governments take prompt action to prioritise climate-conscious social and economic development, the number of people in need of humanitarian aid could drop by roughly 40% compared to today, and by 90% in 2050. 
but this requires stronger global commitment to reduce carbon emissions and promote green growth. Many experts say current national pledges are unlikely to keep global temperatures under 2 degrees Celsius hotter than the pre-industrial age, as set out in the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement. Monday's summit is expected to serve as a test of resolve on climate change, as governments every five years are set to revisit their earlier commitments. The summit will present practical and new measures to, one, speed up the transition from coal to clean energy and to cut the pollution that is harming our health, create cleaner, greener ways to work and to move, speed up the transition in key sectors from grey to green economies, safeguard people from the impacts of climate change already being felt right now. Taking urgent action to combat climate change and its impact on society is one of the United Nations' 17 Sustainable Development Goals set for the year 2030. Oh Young, Arirang News. Yet another funeral for a glacier lost to climate change has been held, this time in Switzerland. So Sunday's so-called funeral march was joined by dozens of people who marked the disappearance of the Pizol Glacier in the Glarus Alps. Organised by the Swiss Association for Climate Protection, the funeral said goodbye to Pizol, which is, quote, no longer a glacier from a scientific perspective. Scientists say the glacier has lost at least 80% of its volume since 2006 due to global warming. A similar ceremony was held in Iceland last month to commemorate Okjokul, a 700-year-old glacier pronounced dead in 2014. It was a day of the long ball for South Korean players in Major League Baseball. LA Dodgers' starting pitcher Liu Hyun Jin collected his first career homer in the big leagues, while Texas Rangers' outfielder Chu Jin Su set a personal record for the most number of home runs in a season. Kan Young-woo has the story. It was the bottom of the fifth inning at Dodger Stadium on Sunday. With his team trailing the Colorado Rockies by a single run, Dodgers starting pitcher Ryu Jin took matters into his own hands, not on the mound this time, but in the batter's box. He took a huge swing on a fastball from Antonio Sanzatelle, and the ball flew over the right center field fence for his first career home run in Major League Baseball. It was his 210th career at bat since joining the big leagues in 2013. Liu becomes just the third South Korean pitcher to hit a homer in the majors, following Park chan and Park cha -sing. Liu's solo shot sparked a rally from his teammates with slugger Cody Ballinger blasting a grand slam to give the Dodgers a 5-1 lead later in the fifth inning. The Korean monster got the job done on the mound as well. Over the course of seven innings, Liu held the Rockies to three runs while striking out eight to earn his 13th win of the season, his first since August 11th as the Dodgers ran out to a 7-4 victory. Meanwhile, another South Korean big leaguer, Texas Rangers outfielder Chu Shin Su, also made history of his own on the same day by setting a new career high in home runs for one season. Leading off in the top of the first inning, the Korean slugger swung at the very first pitch of the game from Oakland Athletics pitcher Tanner Roark for his 23rd round tripper of the year. Inspired by Chu's solo blast, the Rangers scored three more runs in the first inning and eventually went on to take the game by a score of 8-3. The 37-year-old veteran's previous season high was 22 homers, a milestone he reached on three occasions since his MLB debut in 2005. Kan Young-woo, Arirang News. South Korea's football governing body is laying out many options to hold a World Cup qualifying match between the two Koreas in Pyongyang next month. The Korea Football Association is preparing for a number of scenarios, although it has yet to receive an official response from North Korea. The KFA initially wanted its team to fly directly from the South, but have applied for Chinese visas in case they need to travel to the North through a connecting flight from China. Some 30 South Korean players have already applied for the visa, which can take several days to process. The Taeguk Warriors are also considering the possibility of arriving late in Pyongyang just one day before the match. The match, if it takes place as planned in Pyongyang on October 15th, will mark the first ever World Cup qualifier between the two Koreas played in the North. 
There's a coffee shop on every corner in Korea, some just for grabbing a quick cup to go, but others have themes and concepts that make you want to come in and do more than just eat and drink. Art and culture are a couple of the main themes. Our Yoon Jung Min has the story. A coffee shop in downtown Seoul is full of plans to create a more pleasant environment for its customers. People can relax while enjoying the fresh air. The coffee shop also sells the plants. I see more green plants than other shops here and it's spacious and quiet. I often visit this cafe because I can feel the fresh air thanks to the plants. These days, people don't go to cafes for just a cup of coffee, but rather to take a rest, read or even enjoy art while having a beverage. Responding to these demands, coffee shops are changing and are being designed with a range of concepts. They say it's equally important to provide quality products and leave a good impression on customers. And cafes are becoming a nice place for emotional healing in the busy city. With an increasing number of people looking to enjoy coffee in a unique and pleasant environment, cafes are not only changing into botanical gardens but into a range of other concepts like art galleries or study rooms. In another cafe, paintings are lined up alongside a corridor. People might think this place is an art gallery, but in fact, it's a coffee shop. Customers say they like the idea that they can enjoy cultural life at a nearby coffee shop. The shop also sells the paintings too and holds exhibitions by different painters. People usually go to art galleries to enjoy paintings, but I can enjoy them here with coffee. I came here to see the art with some drinks. Also, some groups regularly gather at the shop to read and discuss books together. These days, coffee shops are even functioning as a place to talk and learn. There are already a number of cafes in Korea, so they have to be competitive. More coffee shops are changing into a nice place for a rest and a chat. They want to provide more premium services than other shops. Experts say this trend will keep growing as there will be more and more demand from customers seeking a quality service. Yoon Jung-min, Arirang News. The chairman of the U.S. House Foreign Affairs Committee has urged President Trump to address the escalating tensions between South Korea and Japan and use the U.N. General Assembly to mend their ties. In a letter to the U.S. President, Democrat Elliot Engel underscored the importance of the U.S. playing a strong leadership role on the issue. He added that the dispute has spilled over in a way that directly impacts America's national security and economic interests. Engel said the UN General Assembly is an opportunity for Trump to encourage his South Korean and Japanese counterparts to resolve their differences to prevent further negative impact on the US. Starting next year, one-time passports given to people who forget to bring their own will cost the same as a normal passport. They are currently much cheaper. The foreign ministry says the price will be raised to about 45 US dollars. The ministry said too many people have been taking advantage of the price gap. U.S. discount chain Walmart will reportedly stop selling electronic cigarettes because of growing regulatory obstacles. Local media reports that the retailer will stop e-cigarette sales once its existing stock runs out. In an internal memo, Walmart cited increasingly complex regulations at the federal, state and local level following at least eight deaths and hundreds of cases of vaping-related illnesses. South Korea, meanwhile, has reported no deaths or illnesses from the devices so far, but the health ministry has advised people not to use them. For the first time in almost 40 years, Iran will allow women to attend a World Cup qualifier. The president of FIFA, Gianni Infantino, said Sunday that his organization had been assured by Iran that women will be let into the match next month against Cambodia. FIFA said it will also be working with the Iranian Football Federation to enable women to attend matches in the Iranian Domestic League as well. FIFA had demanded that Iran let women into international matches after an Iranian woman set herself on fire and died earlier this month, protesting against her arrest for attending a game. That has been your three-minute news flash.
It is that time now where we take a look at Arirang's digital media content. And today we have another episode of Win in Korea or Wink with Justin. Hello everybody and welcome back to Wink When in Korea. Since the very first episode, we've covered a variety of content from how to get from the Incheon airport all the way to Hongdae, to even covering all these different kinds of foods, from spicy foods and even some unique spots such as the Poop Cafe, one of my personal favorites. It's already been, it's already been six months. I'm so worried about the future content of Wink. And we need more content, we need better content. I need, uh, I need more vision. I need, I need help, I need advice from people can you help me, buddy? So we'll call this episode the We Don't Know What To Do, so we'll ask random Korean locals what they think that foreigners might like to watch episode. Let's go! Our American friends can be able to watch the show when we go to the show. I have to go to the show, but I don't have to go to the show. Oh, good, good. So, I'm going to eat the meat. Oh, good, good. I've been to the meat. I've been to the meat before, but I've been to the meat. The meat? Yes. 77년 살았어요. 그러니까 김정은이 아버지가 나고 동갑이야. 아 정말요? 네. 죽었어 몇년 전에. 아 네네. 외국인들이 오면 어디가 주냐면 저 용인의 에버랜드. 아 에버랜드. 에버랜드 젊은 관광객들 거참 좋아요. 네. 소는 왕갈비가 제일 유명해 땅 말고. 외국인 위주로 나가는 자막으로 해서. 아 아닙니다. 아버님 아닙니다. 그거 맛있다. 아, 괜찮아요. 감사합니다. 마음만 받겠습니다. 이제 하면 그 포옹으로 한번, 예, 감사합니다. 네, 포옹 많이 받으세요. 네. 아니, 포옹 한번 주세요. 우리 손녀도 다 학교 다니는데. 한강 가는 거 좋아하는데. 한강. 네, 한강 가서 지금 딱 날씨 좋잖아요. 그래서 딱 돗자리 피고, 엽떡에 치킨 시켜가지고 먹고, 이제 또 자전거 타고, 이제 밤에 지금 딱 밤도깨비 야시장 한단 말이에요. 저도 야시장 가서 또 먹고. Where are you guys from? Mikuk Sobang. Mikuk Sobang. So, is there anything you'd like to recommend to other, maybe not just Americans, but other foreigners, the places they could visit, or maybe certain foods that you guys like in Korea? Uh, it's an amazing country. Uh -huh. um, when you think of the history, mm. this country has become the, the part of the Korean War, and it has become all the most uh, um, the places you could recommend. The places oh, right, I could right. recommend. Yeah, any um, place? No, that was great too. Oh, I love I love Insidong, but I love Inside the shop. Right. So Insidong is nice. The area up near the palaces and the blue house is always interesting. Oh, shit. 한국 있는 게 자랑스러우세요? 좋죠. 좋죠. 왜요? 네, 저희 나라 와이파이도 잘 되고요. <웃음> 네. 그리고 스포츠 중에 네. 태권도를 포함해서 또 축구 같은 거도 그렇죠. 많고. 태권도의 가장 큰 장점이 뭘까요? 태권도는 네. 살짝 정신 수양하고 음. 예의를 갖춰서 하는 거기 때문에 그게 좀더 좋은 것 같아요. 어 쉽게 하네. 더, 더 올라가시고. 키를 와 오케이 there we go. 와 너무 잘해 제일 잘했어 진짜 오늘 하루 종일 인터뷰했는데. Where are you from? I'm from Lithuania. L Lithuania. We visited Gangnam Station. Yeah for shopping. Okay. We were looking for the stature uh -huh. like the go to Gangnam. Nature? Oh, God, yeah, yeah, okay. but I thought that it's in Gangnam Station actually, but it was not in Gangnam. Where it was it? in Samsung Station. Open Gangnam Star. All right, everybody, so in today's episode, we covered a lot of ground, speaking to people for recommendations about things that they would like to share with our foreign audience. You guys, thanks so much. Bye. The temperature dropped sharply over the weekend, and now it truly feels like fall. Let's get more details from our Michelle Park, who is at the Weather Center. Michelle. Now, today is Chubun in Korea, also known as autumnal equinox, when the day and night are equally the same length, which also means the end of summer and beginning of autumn. Now, looking at tomorrow's weather, the nation will be looking up to a high and clear blue autumn sky accompanied by some bright sunshine. And now, temperature readings are expected to remain on the cool side as well, along with some cool breeze even during the day. Now, speaking of temperatures, a cold air front is expected to plunge down the mercury a few more degrees. So we'll wake up to 15 degrees Celsius tomorrow, while Taegu and Gyeongju begins Tuesday at 14 and 12 degrees, respectively. And temperatures will soar back up about 10 degrees into a day for most regions. So our Gwangju, Taegu and also for Busan will top out to 26 degrees, while the rest of the country will also have very similar daytime highs. 
Now checking out the weather throughout this week, the capital is expected to stay under a pleasantly mild condition until the weekend, whereas another round of autumn rain is expected in the south. Now I'll leave you with the weather conditions around the world. That will wrap up today's Adirang News Centre. Thank you as always for watching. Keep it tuned to Adirang for news in depth coming up in just a few minutes.